Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and colleagues, how does one speak uh, for Mandela University? The one bearing the name. How does one speak a welcome for Dikhang Mosnaeki? How, I, how do I salute your presence as an audience at this event, a conversation between the justice and the dean? What does one say about all rise after it has amassed so many accolades in book reviews? What does one say of this adventure occasioned by the experience and writing of a person whom Anton Katz described as a brilliant jurist and human being? Some, something we all know. Don't worry, the welcoming note is not a list of questions or ponderings. The questions are meant to remind us that words sometimes need to be invented when you pay homage to someone like Justice Mosinaki. And those attempts at inventing words and sentences may fail. They are fallible in the face of what they try to say or describe. The imperfection and shortcomings of words and phrases do not point to a form of blind idolatry, but to an admiration and democratic gratitude for a life lived as Dikhang Mosinaki and a life lived as Justice Mosinaki. Mosinaki will intimately know of Derrida's gesture towards Mandela in the laws of reflection, Nelson Mandela in admiration, written in 1986, rereading Mandela's African past to confront a law that outlawed him in that apartheid present, a point not dissimilar to the experience and praxis of Justice Mosinaki. And so the two of them meet again, Mosinaki at Mandela University, a Mandela on dock of 2017 amongst the other on docks. It has a special position, I'm sure. Associated with our great faculty of law that in the words of our vice chancellor, generates knowledge that contributes to building a socially just and democratic society, and through its staff and students, put their legal knowledge to work to address the plight of vulnerable communities through engagement and outreach activities. It is perhaps destiny that brought Justice Mosinaki and Mandela University together. We are investing in the new law building linked to the vision of having on docs and adjunct professors from the profession, particularly the judi ju judiciary and people like Justice Mosinaki, to spend time at the faculty as judges in residence, which will have obvious benefits for staff and students and the transformative culture we wish to inculcate. Our university, perpetually haunted by the social figure of Mandela, his work, principles and values has a special affinity for Justice Mosinaki. And we stand in admiration of his contribution to the democratic project, including the work done recently around the life as a domain tragedy. I relay our warmest of welcomes to you, Justice Mosinaki, on behalf of our Chancellor, Chairperson and Vice-Chancellor, Sibongile Mutwa and the executives who are present here today, and on behalf of our entire university community. To Dean Gavanji and his faculty, much thanks for putting this together and a warm welcome as well to all our participants. Thank you very much for attending. Allow me to introduce Justice Mosinaki before I hand over to the Dean. Dikhan Mosinaki was born in Pretoria on 20 December 1947, where he also completed his schooling. At the age of 14, he joined the Pan-Africanist Congress and the following year was arrested, detained and convicted of participating in anti-apartheid activity. He spent 10 years as a prisoner on Robben Island where he met and befriended Nelson Mandela and other leading activists. Mosinaki practiced as an advocate in Johannesburg and Pretoria and was awarded senior counsel status 10 years later. He worked underground for the PAC during the 1980s and became the organization's deputy president when it was unbanned in 1990. Wozniak also served on the technical committee that drafted the interim constitution of 1993. In 1994, he was appointed deputy chairperson of the independent electoral commission, which conducted the first democratic elections in South Africa. In November 2001, Wozniak was appointed to the high court in Pretoria by then Tabum Beke, and a year later, he made 
He was made a judge in the Constitutional Court. In June 2005, he became Deputy Chief Justice. On 4 November 2013, Mosnaki was appointed Acting Ju Chief Justice during the long-term leave of Chief Justice Mufang Mufang. Mosinaki is regarded as one of the strongest judges on the Constitutional Court when he served and has made a significant contribution to South African property law. He penned the Constitutional Court's last three majority judgments on the Restitution of Land Rights Act and decided the leading case on expropriation in 2014. Most celebrated is Mosinaki's judgment in Glenister versus President co-authored with Justice Edwin Cameron, which struck down amendments to the National Prosecuting Act and the South African Police Service Act on the basis that they failed to create an adequately independent anti-corruption unit. This was hailed as an imaginative and brilliant judgment by commentators and means South Africa must have an independent corruption fighting agency, notwithstanding the ruling ANC's controversial disbanding of the Scorpions. Was an aggregate tired from the Constitutional Court in May 2016. Justice Mosinaki has received many awards and honorary doctorates nationally and internationally. In 2006, he succeeded Justice Richard Goldstone as Chancellor of the University of the Witwatersrand. He was also named as an executor of the will of our namesake Nelson Mandela, who died in late 2013. Justice Mosinaki, and here I'm ending, has a towering legal mind, a commitment to fairness and justice, and is a most independent-minded and imaginative jurist. In admiration, Justice Mosinaki, welcome. Over to you, Avinas. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kiert. Thank you for those warm words of welcome. And good afternoon, Justice Mosinaki. Glad uh, you could be here. What a thrill it is to be able to talk to you. Are you doing well? Good afternoon, indeed. Let me start with Professor Andre Kiert. That was warm, that was kind. And that was near, you know, disbelief, but the words are lovely. Thank you so much. And yes, indeed, to you, Dean, uh, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Moseneke. We thought uh, what a wonderful opportunity it is to uh, pick your brain, uh, to use your wonderful book as a launching pad to try to really unpack and get to some of the processes that you've mastered in order to assist our law students and our academics to improve their work and of course to deepen our understanding of the workings of the judiciary. So with your permission, I thought we could have a chat for um, 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll uh, leave time to, to take any any questions and uh, we might even be kind enough to give away a signed uh, copy of your book if we get some uh, good ones from some of our students. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm in your hands and I'll, I'll be guided by you, Dean. Thank you so much. Well, I, I wanted to start with uh, almost the, the end because you, you spoke about the uh, addiction of judicial clout. And I was wondering uh, what it feels like to uh, have that addiction uh, taken away from you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad somebody saw it in that phrase in the book. And thank you for reading the book and taking the time to look. Yes, I remember I went to Zimbabwe to, um, to go and do some work. And I was asked by a president of the time to go and as part of a judicial mission. And my job was to go and see whether the elections were conducted according to the laws of Zimbabwe. <coughs> Excuse me, so quickly I had to learn, study the laws of Zimbabwe, electoral laws, and then to go see whether in fact they've been, and they were all they were observed in the breach. And you remember we produced that uncomfortable report and we said, not free and fair. And the politicians said, well, we think free and fair. I said, well, I understand that, but you know what we think. Um, and, I, and quickly, quickly, I realized that actually I'm better off in the courtroom than out there. And so I quickly reverted back to the courts uh, where judges um, are judges. And, 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 and it's an admission that there is a bit of addiction that comes out of everything of being a judge in the superior courts. Yes. Well, well, perhaps to take you back because you, you spoke before you uh, went to the judiciary about a clearing of the overgrowth and you were referring to your time in business 
uh, with Telcom and with uh, New Africa Investments Limited. And it made me think about some of our students who uh, might, of course, be hell-bent on a, on a career in law, but there might be some uh, detours uh, on the road. And uh, I thought your experience of going into business at that point in your career was an interesting one. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Look, I, I was in my 40s, in my early 40s then. So <clears throat> it didn't, excuse me, it didn't make sense to go to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I beg your pardon. I thought it didn't make sense to go to become a judge then. Um, the excuse was that you need a certain disposition, which you get out of years of living. And averagely, people become judges around 50 plus. And that's considered to be a time when you're fairly reasonably, reasonably settled and balanced in your demeanor. Um, and therefore, for that reason, quite often I, I thought about it and I said, no, not yet. And two, I had done a long slog as a struggle lawyer. I had done everything that could be done. And you can see in the book, for instance, most of the work, there were no fees. You know, uh, it was the love of labor, the love of the freedom struggle, and the cases were many. So, and I thought it was the time to lift my head. You know, we'd just become a democracy. I had just gone through writing the interim constitution together with others. I had gone through running the elections. It was a hard slog. And it was a national project. So I went around the, the country with, with Johann Krichler, who was my colleague then, he was a judge already. And we came to PE, we came, we went to Transcar, we went everywhere else setting up a, if what I can call a good selection. It was a quick, instant election. In four months, we had to get everything ready and get going. Because the date was set and then we had to work backwards to try and reach the date. And after all that, I thought, well, I've paid my dues. Throw in Robben Island on top of that. And I thought it's time for me to play a little. I'm going to go out of the strictures of law and the struggle and, and get into business, which I did. Prompted by an invitation to become the chairman of Telcom. At a time when there was an explosion, as I say in the book, uh, <clears throat> with data technology. And it was something new. It's almost like I had new toys to play with. And um, started rolling out digital communication across the country and establishing Vodacom, which didn't exist at the time. And as chairman, we had to bankroll the first uh, major loan that Vodacom shareholder loan. So it was, yes, I didn't want to become a judge immediately. And I took a detour and I thought, I still have my 50s and 60s and 70s and I was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will come to your, your, your time as a, as a judge, but I was very interested to read some of your strategies as an advocate and uh, it made me marvel at the level of mastery because you indicated that, you know, you would know your customer if it was a particularly verbose judge, you will, uh, you would present arguments uh, in, in a way that would suit that judge's yeah, and if it was a judge looking for a killer point, you would give the judge a couple of killer points. And if a, a philosophically <laughs> minded judge, you'd, you'd phrase your arguments in that way. So I really you know, thought it would be good to say to our students, how does one get to that level of mastery where you can really be focusing on some of the nuances rather than just uh, you know, the black letters in front of you? Indeed, and um, when you want to become good counsel, First, you must know the facts, as I say in the book. Two, you must know the law that arises from the facts, from the dispute. And three, you must know your judge, <clears throat> because that is the other party in it. It's your client, the facts, the law, and then somebody has to blow the whistle, that's the judge. So every, often I would, as I say in the book, it was helpful to look on the notice board and say, 
I've drawn Strumpfa, there was a judge in the Kauteng High Court, <coughs> excuse me, or I've drawn Imstra, or it would be one of those arms, or it would be because, as you know, judges were, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> judges were all white males. So it would have been one of those, uh, either a Himstra or a Strumpfa or a, you know, Van Berg and so on. And once I knew who the judge was, having practiced long, I knew what would work. For instance, Justice Harms, in my own Liberatex, I talk about this killer point, which I, I I once raised before him of somebody who was arrested and kept in a police cell. And the warrant arrest said he must be kept in a prison cell. And I rose on my feet and said, you know, okay, he smiles because I've said a few words in Afrikaans and I go and say, my Lord, the detention is unlawful. Um, why so? Why so? Well, a lot, the warrant of arrest specifies where Mr. Ramadipa should be kept. They chose to keep him in prison. It could have been on their farm. It could have been in their boot, vehicle boot. It could have been in a foul run. No, my lord, you are detained at a place specified in the warrant. And that is what the law requires and no less. So the detention is unlawful. You could see his eyes rolling and rolling and as a lawyer, the point was good. So that's, that is the bull point you sometimes give to your judge. And, and that particular judge, Justice Harams, love killer points. So if you gave him a killer point, that would bring the case to an end. And that's what I gave him and the, the case came to an end. So in short, you must know your judge and you must know if he's a judge who's impatient, doesn't want many words, you must have few words. If he's a judge who likes Going all over, like Justice Albi Sex, then you also go all over, you know. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure our students uh, can identify with that because I'm sure some of them are thinking they also need to know their professors when they're answering <laughs> their, <laughs> and their assignments. But but perhaps you know I, I wanted to reflect a little bit on the old boys club and uh, the the in my time uh, judges and uh, of course it's something that academics can. Uh, resonate with as well. But, you know, has the transformation from your perspective in respect of uh, black judges, women judges, academics on the bench, I mean, are we going to see a female Chief Justice uh, anytime soon? Are we, are we on track? I must tell you, except for the latter part, which I won't easily answer, I think we're on track. Think about it. In 19, the book makes the point with that transition, before 1994, you had to be white, male, senior counsel, and basically um, liked by the Minister of Justice to become a judge. Of course, many will tell you there was excellence. Yeah, there was in part excellence. But the fact of the matter is that that was the profile. And the, it, and the appointment of judges was done politically. It was, it was a mis you know, the judge president would say, yeah, so-and-so would make a good judge, and then the Minister of Justice would, would appoint that person. So it was a self-serving arrangement to reproduce the same people to become the guardians of the law. And of course, the guardians of the common law. So you had a very unique but close arrangement. Not even white women made you know, cracked it. There were only about three white women in 1994 when, you know, when we changed to democracy. So it was obvious that one of the big things was to change the profile of judges. Now let me go to the end because it's a glorious story. Currently, something like 65% of all judicial officers are people of color or women. Now that's quite a movement from 1994 to where we are. And in their midst, you're going to find academics, you're going to find attorneys, you're going to find um, people who have been law advisors, for instance, within government and so on. So suddenly, with the opening up of democracy, we opened up the nursery, 
the place where you could get, you know, new lovely things that will grow within the judicial setting. And it worked. I mean, I give you examples in the book, if you think about somebody like Kate O'Regan, who was a professor of law, or even Mokoro who was a professor of law, and they had no significant practice. They were not totally blind to it, but they're not practice like me. I was a traditional kind of guy who went through, you know, the ropes to senior counsel. And then comes these judges, you know, Musineke, um, this is a slippery slope. Uh, we're going to have all sorts of judges who are never going to make the mark. No, we don't mean you. You're okay. Like you're like us. You, you know, you've gone through the ropes and became senior counsel. In other words, we're really saying you must draw only from our pool. But then would we'll perpetuate a male-centric, white male-centric judiciary that would repeat and perpetuate the values that they were fed on, both at law schools, I'm afraid, as well as in their families and within apartheid circles. And we're trying to change society. So as I listen to it, and you know how I write about it, one of the key things we did, which was good, was to open possible appointments to everybody. And those who've come from the academy, Dennis Davis, there are many others, who've come from the academy have done extremely well as judges. And so too, senior attorneys have come with a lot of brilliance onto the bench. So the old boys always said, yeah, you know, it's a slippery slope. You know, how could they be any good, these new judges? And uh, people like Johan van der Westhuizen was a law professor. And these judges would try and discriminate against him, in my favor against him, because he didn't come through the boys club. And um, there's one good thing we did, was to basically um, to integrate the judiciary and make it very representative. And today, look at your television. You don't know what magistrate you're going to draw in which case, you know, some are women, some are white, some are black, some, you go right across the, with a lovely integration. And as I say in the book, the judicial sky did not come down, did not cave in. So with many people of color who are gracing the bench and um, they're doing good work, quality work. One of the nice things about uh, having a, a book uh, like yours is that we, we get a little bit of an insight into what is happening behind the scenes. I mean, I didn't realize, for example, that you had an adversity to the green robes initially, and of course now it adorns the, the cover of the book. But it, it made me think about what we're seeing with the US Supreme Court process now involving uh, Amy Barrett and, and what you refer to as the inarticulate premise. Uh, what is it that's behind the, the face that we see uh, when we appear in a, in a court? So, so really the question is, do, do you think we get to know enough of what makes our judges tick uh, prior to appointment and particularly with a hot job like the uh, Chief uh, Justice uh, coming up soon? It's better now. In the past, you knew nothing. Think about it. The Minister of Justice looked around and liked the senior counsel and, uh, and were drawn basically from the same place, as I've said. So you knew nothing about the judge. But also there was a cloister. It was almost like going to the nunnery or going to some monk retreat of sorts you know, in the Tibet or something or maybe going uh, up the mountain for some ritual. And when you come back, you don't say a word about it. It's a passage ritual, but you come back and you keep quiet about it. So in many ways, we inherited that from the English and the English judiciary, but also our own judiciary. That's why you don't find any judicial memoirs and I, I, I said in another audience, Rose Innes wrote around 18, whatever, 1887 or something, wrote a judicial memoir. There's some that came close to what is here, but also there's very strict, structured and strictured and stiff. So I was trying to really lift the judicial gown. And I was trying to say, you're dealing with human beings. 
they are fallible. They are selected from a, a spread of us. They represent us. And in the past, they were that narrow click. Now they were drawn from everywhere. Anyone who's good and studied law could become a magistrate, a regional, and, and they become powerful people, magistrates. They've got just as much, and I spent time in the book to sing praises of magistrates, how hard they work and how much they deserve our respect and so on. Um, and, and today you look at the big graph that's happening on your television. You can see the magistrates doing the work, as I've described in the book, the high court, big graft, you work hard. There always is, as I say in the book, fewer judges than there's work. But what is worse, in 1994, the, the high court, which was then called the Supreme Court, was meant for about three, four million people, because it really served a small coterie of South Africans. And even amongst them, the top and upper class of that privileged group. And suddenly 55 million people should be served by the courts. And more and more people go straight to the high court rather than to the other courts. So when I got there, I found a lot of work and, and I describe it with some detail about it. But that inarticulate premise, as you know, has been recognized over the years by jurisprudence. We bring to the job our upbringing. We bring to the job a premise. And the premise is inarticulate because usually it's not, you don't hold it on your chest, except you're unfortunate like some of us. Everybody knows I'm an ex-corn. So everybody can say, you know, he was an ex-corn and he was part of the liberation movement and so on, but not every judge comes to court in that way. And for that reason, we are trained continually to seek to distance oneself from one's past, one's premise, to respect it, but never to impose it. Um, and we can talk some other time about sensitivity training that was done under Arthur's court, for instance, and, and I can get that to there. But today the JSC gets everything about the history of a judge. The, the, Civil society organizations that investigate every person who puts herself or himself up as a judge. They troll cyberspace to see what have you said and not said in the past and so on. So it has become much more transparent and has become much more um, something of, of public debate. It was unthinkable that even during my time, people would say, we think the Chief Justice should be so-and-so. Not only a woman, but these women. So it is, it is quite unthinkable, but she, there we are. That's where we are. Uh, democratization of information and knowledge and views uh, from that closed process of appointing judges. And now we are where we are, and we also have all rise that tells us what they do when they work. No, ab absolutely. And I think uh, the, the book should be uh, mandatory reading for, for anybody who wants to get an idea of the, the work involved uh, on the part of a high court judge. But I want to quote from the, the book. You say, electronic filing must be a mandatory norm with a sensitive caveat for those in need of justice. Our state judicial officers, legal practitioners, and people must set as an uppermost priority the digitization of justice, a continued failure to do so will render justice impossible. And we've seen recent criticisms um, directed towards the office of the Chief Justice in terms of what is happening with the, let's call it the bread and butter of the administration uh, surrounding our high courts. And, and that's a cause for, for concern, I think, uh, for, for the country. Your, your views on that? Well, yes, we need, we need judicial robustness. You know, um, ideas alone cannot do it, cannot cut it. 
you want to set up a law school, you better give it legs to run. You need both warm bodies, which are imaginative, as well as resources to make it happen, to make it possible. Now we've hit where we are and look at the way we're discussing all rise digitally. Um, I've done a few arbitrations online, pretty much the same way. I've had and you know, listened to witnesses pretty much on this medium. And many of my colleagues have done that too, even more so. They are active, they are there. Um, so we need digital filing in, in, a, in a real way. We need to protect those dockets which are stolen. Every other rape case, the dockets are not, are not there, they're gone. Every other case, I mean, drunken driving case, the dockets just go, you know. Um, so there's no proper secured record keeping uh, quite often, and that challenges our ability to be able to fight crime, to do justice, but also just efficiency issues. We, we cannot, the judiciary cannot, it's a vital one third of a state function and it can never ever be left behind. So yes, that is my plea and I, I've been to a few jurisdictions where I've seen all filings done digitally and nobody goes to court, it gets, it gets done remotely and everything else. And people do the same thing now in other cases like mediations and arbitrations and so on, people don't come together. Uh, in part thanks to coronavirus, but also because of modernity. So we don't have to chop down all those trees and so on. So we, we have, we are there. And the judiciary is a plea, a, a very loud plea, for that function not to be left behind because society can't function without an effective judiciary. Mm. So, I, I mean, I, I gather, you know, when I read about the division of work that you settled upon with the Chief Justice Mkhweng Mkhweng uh, when you were DCJ and, and the whole establishment of the Office of the Chief Justice and we've got the Department of Justice in the, in the background, but I, I get the sense that uh, it's perhaps more than just a, a plea for, for resources. Uh, I, I assume, um, I mean, it's, it's a fine balance to, to, to run the entire court system from a particular office. Uh, have we done the right thing in the way we've set it up structurally? Yeah, you know, the mantra <clears throat> at, at one time, particularly with the beginning of the Nova Court, um, having seen this in the US where he really studied at Harvard University, the mantra was, <clears throat> the, the, the excitement was institutional independence of the judiciary. And that's an attractive idea intellectually. And that meant that the judiciary will do everything and will go to parliament and go and ask for a, a vote. And it would have infrastructure that would run the courts. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you wouldn't need Department of Justice, not a Minister of Justice, because all that would be done by the Office of the Chief Justice. And everybody in the judiciary would work for this one employer, Office of the Chief Justice. It was ambitious. It, I never was part of it because I always valued much the space, you know, to write judgments, to contribute to jurisprudence. And as you know, I wrote my heart out in, 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 in <clears throat> so I, I, I didn't get, but the hope and the belief was that um, both of them, both Justice Nova and Justice Mohueng, who inherited that, thought they could actually have a whole machinery that runs uh, the judiciary, and there's always contestation from the Department of Justice because you're threatening so many jobs in the process and threatening the power arrangements with the Minister of Justice. And the te other tension was the president of the day wanted to have a hold on to at least the administrative part of the judicial function. You know, who pays the salary, who grants leave, who all of those things that might affect a judge in one way or the other. And, and so the, the experiment, I think, never came into fruition. And currently there's a lot of criticism 
Um, and two, I don't think <clears throat> the government has always come to party, to the party with the funding that's required. Many of the courts look horrible. Many of the magistrates' court need attention. And, and they're vital parts of the court. If there's any part of government that works currently, it's the judiciary. You just need to look. I don't say it worked perfectly, but it certainly works. Magistrates wake up in the morning and prosecutors and things, they go to the courts and they do the work. And we can talk about those loaded circumstances and difficult situations, which is in part also a function of low resources. Very quickly, I know you want to move on to something else. When last we were we investigated why there were so many postponements. The investigative capacity of the police had dropped. So cases would be opened, but the dockets would not be rounded off with full investigation and ready for prosecution. So every time they give it to the prosecutor, this is missing, that is missing. But let me tell you some of the basic things that were missing that infuriated many magistrates and judges. Drunken driving, there'd be no report of blood analysis for 12 to 18 months. And no right thinking judicial officer would trust a report that comes 18 months that purports to have followed all the linkages. The law prescribes what you do with somebody's blood that you take off the, the roadside to the point where you present a report to court. And these are safeguards to make sure that you don't have Z's blood mixed up with P's blood or Y's blood mixed, you know. So it's to protect people, but also to make sure that justice is properly done. <clears throat> Most of those pathology or forensic laboratories collapsed, which meant it was difficult, therefore, to get a spam specimen. It was difficult to, to test women who may have been raped. It was difficult to um, take a variety of evidence, DNA tests that you need or blood tests that because the laboratories were dysfunctional. That always leads to cases that are not ready for trial and lead to failure of justice. So judiciary needs much, much more institutional support and robustness to do its work fully. Just to change tack a little bit, the uh, hashtag Feeds Must Fall uh, movement 2016 2017 the debates that we saw around decolonization of the curriculum and it it, it resonated with me when I, I read you talking about the decision of the constitutional court in terms of the form of address picking justice uh, dispensing with my lord my lady um, honorable this and that and in, in a way i suppose the one comment is that it's interesting that the the top court didn't set the tone for the others. And the the second point really is, do you think that we must all be ready to live with what we have in terms of the formalities, the the roving and all the rest, or, or is there space in the future for um, some decolonization of the judiciary? I would hope so. <clears throat> That's why I spent time in the book to write about it and, and the attempts that we made and to show you how in part they failed because high court judges felt we were sufficiently respected and we can afford to to drop off all these little trinkets you know of my lord my lady and all that and uh, we've been dropped the title honorable we just use justice musineke or justice so-and-so stop describing the work you do like professor so-and-so justice so-and-so doctor so-and-so engineer so-and-so i mean <coughs> so we were trying to demystify the role and we knew that we inherited this from the UK. And you see how I write about how I surprised myself being excited, being senior counsel and going out to London to go and buy a proper silk gown and thinking that, you know, I've earned it, I'm entitled to it. And wait a minute, Mr. Neke, what was happening there, you know? Um, so in many, many ways, we have been entangled in that. 
But at the principal level, the point that the book makes right at the beginning is the one that I made in a lecture which I <coughs> delivered at a certain Nelson Mandela University, in which I prefigured what I was going to write in the book. And that's why I didn't publish the lecture, which really was that it is okay to have historical honesty. The common law is, is a colonial imposition. But for the colonial enterprise in this part of the world, there would have been no common law drawn from Holland. And our common law is a mixture of Roman Dutch law and English law. And both because both were our colonial masters. And that is why I had to study English one, Latin one, and Africa Netherlands one in order to be able to do LLB in my time, without which you were out. You had to show those certificates before or first year courses before you registered for LLB. And the reason was that you had, of course, to access foreign material. Now, I'm not saying that with any agro is a historical fact, it is true. And in that process, indigenous marriages, of course, were no marriages, despite there being a common law. And therefore, people were born illegitimate in a sense, out of wedlock. There were no marriages according to Hindu rights. They're not recognized. They're not marriages or Islam rights. So there was that narrow enclave, the power exercise that came with the law that was meant to be common. But in 1994, we, we gave it new oxygen. We agreed that we will retain the common law despite the history I've just described, provided that it was consistent with the Constitution. And of course, indigenous law got dis displaced over 300 years. Think about it. The colonial project was long. So <clears throat> it fossilized and part of it died. It was not properly recorded. When it was recorded like the Zulu code, it was a monster, you know, total patrimony at its worst end, you know, with a crawl head and everybody else must crawl, C-R-A-W-L, you know what I mean? Because he was there and he was everything. He was administrator of the state, he was everything. He received the lobola, he, he owned the land, he owned them. So what is our task there for now? Our task is to take those parts of the law, and that's what law schools ought to be doing, and we can debate that a little later. Those liberating parts of the law. What made it worse was that the common law was then had a statutory <clears throat> layer, which was horrible, called apartheid. And it really um, mangled up the wonderful principles, libertarian principles that you found in the common law. So you had a mix mesh of apartheid and the colonial imposition that wasn't quite fun. And yet up to now, you see in the book, I show you how certain courts would not talk about any, uh, any law other than the common law. They would not even have regard to the constitution. They would not even seek to find new values in the African knowledge system, in and so on, you know, to, to, to bring in new values, in contrast to values that were drawn in 1600 in Holland. So one has to be upfront and fair and open about this. And that led, of course, you see in the book of the Chaskelson saying, there's only one administrative law in this country not two sets of laws. We don't have administrative law drawn from the common law and administrative law drawn from the constitution. This is one neighborhood and there's one law. And, and that is why the constitutional court was there, was to be the source of a law. And when Kentridge A.J. wrote in Thungu, you reach the constitutional law only by if you don't find any rule in the common law. We young techs came very quickly and said, no, 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 you're wrong. 
And I do that in the book. I call him out and I say, you're wrong. No, you start with the Constitution. And if the Constitution covers the issue, it's the Constitution you rely on. And that's what I hope the academy should be and is teaching. You go to life as a demani, you find egregious constitutional breaches. You don't say, ah, oh, the, the common law never envisaged this. How could it have envisaged this? In 1600 Holland, in Europe, how could it have envisaged this? And therefore, there is no remedy. And if there's no remedy arising from the constitution, in other words, if there are no constitutional damages, the constitution is a dead duck. And that serves the ends of those who don't want it to be a living document and to provide sustenance and 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 deliverance as well as you know compensation when it's necessary so on that reasoning i should have concluded in life as a demani sorry look look at all these contraventions of constitutional provisions and i said them in their full glory from international law right across to our own law and i said look what devastation and look at the death and the torture that came out of us. And the government argued that I should find that the common law doesn't recognize any of us hurt. And of course, I reached a different conclusion. And the real principal decision is really that the Constitution ought to be a life document. It ought to bring relief. Uh, both in damages as well as in other forms. Um, but many love the Constitution when it brings relief to deal with the executive, but not when it brings relief in a terrain deemed to be a private law terrain. And there's no such terrain. A principal source of law in this country is the Constitution, and from it follows the rest. Reminds me a, a lot of the remarks you made when you addressed our private law and social justice uh, conference. And uh, we, we're getting some great questions on the on the chat, and I'd like to move to them in a minute. I I, I want to ask one more question, and and that relates to the the so-called Klope saga, because uh, former Constitutional Court Justice Johan Krikler has just noted that the JSC has now acted very swiftly in recommending the suspension of uh, judges Nana Makubela and Mushtaq Parker. And yet, as you note in the book, it's been 12 years uh, for the uh, case involving Justice Klope. In fact, I read today there's a further delay now, something to do with his counsel delaying the matter until December. So my question is, uh, can we take a positive out of this and say perhaps the JSC is moving in a new direction in respect of these things? And should we see the Klope saga as being an unfortunate uh, anomaly in relation to that direction? Yes, I'm afraid there's not been an anomaly. In the last uh, 25 years, I don't think we've covered ourselves in glory. Um, I don't think judges have been exemplary in holding their own to account. Um, judicial function, like all other functions in society, particularly public functions, are always subjected to a code. A code ethics, a code of conduct, and all judges know that. And we train it even in the Judicial Education Institute, we train it in the Justice College for magistrates, we train it. It is, it is and you get trained at, at law school, you get trained everywhere else about the do's and the don'ts of the profession and of, of the judiciary. And we have quite failed. I mean, that was a very glaring example of um, a good 12 years. And that's why I throw it at you and I say, well, you be the judge. I hope that the JSC would actually wake up. The legislation which was set up is very defective, just very poorly drafted. It has to be repealed and redone. It, it is so contorted and it was half-hearted. It almost was like judges will never, no judge had been impeached up to that point. And that would never ever happen. But you had a closed coterie of people who were in one narrow community. Suddenly you've got judges all over in all courts and in all, and even if it happened in the past, I'm sure you'd never hear about it. 
But now we hear about it. And it's proper that it be transparent. So I really hope, I mean, we haven't done well with Judge Matata's case, for instance. It dragged on and on. And if you go and look, it was all the rings around the rules and the law and the process. And judges know about that more than any litigant. And they should not be doing that. So I really hope that we will. And if we are serious about preserving the judiciary, judges must be the first to submit to uh, the disciplinary codes of their profession. Just as a passing, you know, I can remind, remind most judges, the Bar Council is a rule where you're obliged to report an advocate who does something wrong in your presence. It's an obligation which is chargeable. If you don't, you yourself will be charged. So I used to wonder when I was an advocate at the time, but actually something that is incredibly powerful. It means all of us become each other's keepers. You become your sister's keeper, or your brother's keeper. Um, and we, we, we need, we're in a society where we need all that almost in every part of, of public and, and, and private life to be each other's keepers on, on judicial or and on, on ethical conduct. Yeah, of course, in, in some cases um, that whistle is blown. I need to be um, sucked back in uh, sometime sometime later. But uh, let's 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 leave let's leave that uh, topic for now. I want to thank uh, particularly our students who uh, asked some some questions of you, and I'm going to to move to some of those at at, at random. Um, and I trust people uh, forgive us if we don't get to all of them. The, there's one on the Concord clerkship, and and I, I really enjoyed in the in the book where you uh, almost described as these cases were heard, sort of hot out of the the oven. You would throw the the case to your clerks and say, well, what now? What do you think the the answer is? And the question is from Lisa Zanani. I was wondering if you comment a bit more on the process of Concord clerkship. What goes into a particular justice's decision? in hiring clerks and what informs the ideal candidate and what roles and to what extent did you use your clerks from the moment an application reached the court to the time you issued your judgment? Thank you, a beautiful question. Of course, if, if you read the book, you're going to find the answer right there, sitting right there in the middle. Um, <clears throat> let's kill a few syllabus. I mean, the first of this is clerks don't write judgments, okay? In my chamber, no class wrote any judgment that is primary, that is, you know, preeminently my task. And I enjoyed it and I wrote with great flair and enjoyment. Um, let me tell you what, how we choose law clerks. One, you must have an LLB degree from the of South Africa. And if you are a foreign clerk, you must have an equivalent of an LLB degree, a JD or, or any other equivalent uh, qualification. Two, we invite clerks, as you know, and we, we post all sorts of advertisements at law schools to come out and apply. Three, we have a code internally that the clerks will be representative of all things that we are, including, including uh, geography. I'm very proud that I've had a good few students from NNM New, as it was then, and Nelson Mandela University now. So I very consciously chose them, UWC. I very consciously went out to UWC to choose young clerks there because I had just had a sense that the UCT uh, verse brigade were sort of always like on the upfront. They were near and they could access this and, and they could do so. And, um, and I've had clerks from all over the African continent. That part of the clerkship is where we try and get clerks from judges on in, the, in democracies, obviously, on the African continent to clerk at the Constitutional Court for six months. In that way, we hope to be able to get the seed and the influence running across the continent. And all of them up to this day, those I had from Uganda, from Kenya, from Ghana, up to now, right to me, I've had from Germany, I've had from Canada, I've had from Australia, Japan. They write to me up to this day, um, telling me about their careers. So you have to have passed with high marks. Judges tend to look at industry, it's a very important part. If you came with 50s, you're going to struggle to make the shortlist. 
So whatever you are doing, you must shoot for A's and B's to make the first card grain. Two, every judge would choose 10 to 15 <clears throat> young people that they would interview. Sometimes 20 are interviewed. Because I also use the occasion to listen to young people coming from law schools, what gossip is there and what do they want to tell me about their careers and so on. Um, and then the judge is entitled to three law clerks per term. And they rotate them every. So if you appoint a law clerk, you'll be for a year and you'll be paid quite handsomely, um, almost like a junior advocate in the in the NPA and so on. So you'll be paid well enough to be able to live in Joburg because you, wherever you come from, you must migrate to go and live and find an apartment in Joburg. Judges use clerks for a whole range of things. And I write in the book what I use my clerks for. One, every one of them must read everything I read because I'm going to debate with them. I need them as a sounding pad, and that's very important. Two, they must sit in court for every case I sit in. Three, they must give me preliminary recommendations on whether or not to hear a particular case, an application for leave stage. So I force them to go and plow in there and read the judgment of maybe of the magistrate of the high court or the SCA and to produce a critique why it ought to be either sustained or reversed. So it's quite a, a substantive function. After every case, as I've said, I asked my clerks to come in and tell me how would they decide the case and why. And there I know if, if you haven't read, of course, you're in trouble. I mean, that's the moment when I know whether or not you've done your homework. And so I kept them on their toes. They've all come out to be incredible. Because your law clerks, I can list them by my finger, whether it's Adila Hasimo or Jeff Bartlender or it's Nuka Aitobi, um, you know, Tembeka, or it's I can move on. Half of them are judges, others are senior counsel, some. So they find it a valuable experience. Please do apply. And young lawyers from Nelson Mandela University should apply. With an LLM, you have an edge, obviously, on the other candidates. Well, we've been uh, so fortunate to have employed a few former constitutional court judges at clocks on the on the staff. And uh, yes. also our postgrad associate program has also been a, a nice stepping stone for, for people moving into that space. Uh, Jabulile asks, is judicial capture something we should be concerned about or are we being alarmist? by paying attention to it? And if it is an issue, what should be done to stop this? And if not, uh, is there any credence into the talk of the judiciary being captured? I, d I don't think. I don't think the judiciary is captured. If you mean the judges who serve the ends and the purpose of a particular political clique, or elite, if, this, if this, that's the definition. I think, I think not. You know, if you go and read the book, please, I hope you find time to do so. I give you what happened with the contestation, political contestation within the ruling elite and the ruling party in particular. And I give you chapter and verse of how the litigation started flowing from Polokwani and how every contest within that space came to us for adjudication. How even fights within political parties came to the judiciary. Just the other day I had some youth leaks saying if, if their mother body doesn't respond, they're going to go to the, to the judiciary and look for an interdict. That I remember I said in a case in Mangawung when some party had its annual uh, you know, elective conference in Mangawung, and the case is reported. Um, uh, and it's used quite a lot when there are contests within political parties. So, judges don't choose cases. Cases choose judges. No judge would be useful to any political elite. We've proven that, and history has shown that and read the book. 
the fact that you are appointed by a particular president means nada, it means nothing. You have to persuade your colleagues with your writing and your intellect and your understanding and commitment to the law and the values of our constitution, which you put down on paper. We are 11, for instance, the constitutional court. So you must persuade 10 other judges that you are right. And I tell you in the book how a scribe works, how you send it to other judges, how they look at it, how in the end, if they agree with in principle, will go and check whether they agree with you even sentence by sentence. So it's a very thorough process. In the SCA, judges sit five. In the High Court on Appeals, judges sit three. And in the High Court, a judge will sit alone, but subject to appeal. So you must be particularly clever and creative and to actually to be able to serve some capturing master. The judiciary is not like, and there's been structured that way intentionally. That's what the book is there for. If you want to know this, you go look at the book. There was a time in the middle of some president's high point, some intelligence documents said people like me and Tuli Madonsela, the Justice of Universities and a few other people, Justice Froneman, who comes from this part of the world, are CIA spies. And I said, well, it looked like I'm captured. I don't know by whom. Maybe the Americans or somebody. Bring the proof. And I wrote to Jacob Zuma, who was our president at the time, and I said, produce the proof. And he got his intelligence people to go and run around, and they produced a report that says, oh, Museneki is one of our greatest patriots. We love him, he's a good South African, good patriot, good African, good black person, good everything in South Africa. Sorry, he's not a sellout. It's a long answer, but all in short, I think you'll have to work very hard to capture the judiciary. One magistrate somewhere could make some error or one judge somewhere, but as a complete thing, as all had to learn, as Justice Mukwege had to learn and everybody else, you need the support of everybody you work with. Just being the chief alone is not enough. You need much more than that. Mm. So you can't, you, can't, you can't implement your CAPTCHA plans in the judiciary to be very difficult. Mm. Perhaps uh, two or three more. You, you, you tell such a beautiful uh, anecdote uh, referring to President Zuma in relation to uh, judges and uh, Muammar Gaddafi, who uh, <laughs> went, went told that, you know, uh, President Zuma couldn't get away with certain things because the judiciary is there. And Gaddafi says, uh, you know, what judges are you talking about? You know, but uh, <laughs> in any event, uh, Professor Krauser asks, how do we encourage lawyers firstly to think ethically and act with a strong desire to see justice done instead of concentrating on winning at all costs? Yes, it's, 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 it's a valid thing, Professor Kraus, and, and that's what we should do all the time. And I don't know if that's the same Professor Kraus who was in Life as the Many with me or not. It might be. Indeed. Indeed. Oh, I say wonderful and good to hear from you. No, yes. Um, the law school should help us with that as a starting point. I do make the point somewhere in the book about the fact that not only are we an honorable profession, our primary task is the pursuit of judicial truth. And lawyers have to assist courts to achieve judicial truth. And when the truth hurts your client, that's when you should be at your most attentive and ensure that your client submits to the consequences of his or her conduct. Lawyers are not there to help people escape criminal accountability or civil accountability. And that is why the Bar Council ethics tell you over and over again, and the attorney's profession ethics tell you, if you cannot knowingly put a case before a court 
knowing or rather know, put your kids what they call knowing it to be lies. You may not fabricate lies for in behalf of your clients. In the 40 something years I've known this, I've done political trials over and over again. And I've always encouraged people rather to stick to their convictions than to try and crook the system. That is something very vital, very important. And we should teach this all the time, even more than the law we teach. Values of openness, of transparency, of accountability. Those things should be taught at law school and they should be taught to all lawyers, to all advocates, to all, all judges. Yes. Um, perhaps a, a final one, a question relating to the development of customary law. Do you perhaps think that the court missed an opportunity in the King Dalin Dearborn case to use a traditional court or to see uh, how customary law could have uh, you know, dealt with the matter? Yes, I mean, customary law is, 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 I find it always to be quite a complicated area to know the form of development that we ought to focus on. And there are two reasons. One, historically, it got fractured all over the show. So it, it, most of the practices lack the kind of consistency that you require in order to implement law. But the fact that this application is also limited is not, is not, it's not in itself a, a, you know, a blemish that is irreversible. Far from it. Two, we've always never known which parts to elevate and which parts to drop, but we need to know that. And lawyers who are interested in indigenous law and so on should do more work to identify, as we do when we deal with the, with the common law from time to time, the bad things you drop off. I was saying to some students the other day, the investor vendor, under the common law in the olden days, you never could rape your wife. It was not, it was not an offense because she was deemed to have given perpetual consent. And that was not too long ago. That's when I studied private law, that was the law. Of course, it was modernized and ultimately dropped. So when we at the Constitutional Court met Bear, the Bear case, where only adult males under the, the primogenitor rule, male primogenitor rule can inherit. We said, no, it can't be. You're going to leave women poor forever. If they can never inherit, then they will be under perpetual, you know, hegemony of men. And we struck that down. So we're going to have to spend time and energy, the wonderful things in indigenous law. The values around dignity and Ubuntu are incredible. For instance, the way African people marry in indigenous marriages, wonderful. Those things should be preserved and protected. Certain many notions in indigenous systems of collectivism. I am because you are and we are to, we are because we are together. That kind of where you're going to want to work. But there are certain things, for instance, that militate against that. Land, for instance, tenure, which is working against women currently, rural land tenure. So we've got to, there's a lot of work to be done. It must be preserved. But I think the challenge is knowing what to preserve and what not to preserve. Well, thank you for all those responses and for taking these questions. I suppose oh. I, I want to end off by asking you, what does the, the future hold for you? It's a, as a justice in non-active service, but a, a justice who's particularly busy in so many senses, uh, writing books and uh, doing so much other work. Um, any insights into your, your future plans? Can we expect another book? <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, Dean, I've come to the end of my runway, I think. I remember somebody, in, when we were bidding farewell to one of our judges, um, some counsel said, you know, to retire is to expire. You know, <laughs> that as you retire, uh, ordinarily you expire. In fact, many judges do retreat into their cocoon when they do retire. You'll never hear of them again. You'll never see them again except on, in their judgments. There was a tradition that judges would disappear, you know, into the firmament and, and they'd be gone once they've served. 
And I am at that point where I'm very close to disappearing into the firmament. Um, I had to write the second book. One, it was a promise. Two, hopefully, I think it's a necessity. And it records a, a, a vital part of our history, I would hope, and discloses the function that is quite vital in society. And one that ought not to be abused or try start and understood in its essence. Uh, I don't think I'll write another book. <laughs> I think I must make that clear. Yes, I will. I will visit. I'll do occasional lectures at universities um, because the whole book, as you see, is dedicated to young people, both of this land and of Africa. And um, I wish them well and I wish that they would know when they no longer enjoy freedom and respect and social justice. And I pray that they would know it and will do something about it. And in my words, I hope they all will rise in order to defend these valuable things, which some of us fought so valiantly to have them in place. So I wish them well. I wish they, there's a generational renewal, both in law, because this is book is about law and the judicial function, and in the larger civic accountability zone. Um, our country needs that. And wherever I've gone, the, the debates have been quite robust, but only from young people, they get it. They truly get it. And, and this is what the book was meant to do, preserve history and edge our young people towards a brighter future than ours. Well, we want to thank you for, for the book and I really want to encourage all our students and, and staff that are, are listening as well as the legal practitioners uh, from the division who have joined us to, to read the book because it does provide fascinating insights. I, I was hoping, I must confess, that in response to this last question, you were going to say to me that you were now playing golf twice a week, not once a week, and that you're <laughs> That too I do, and I read what I like for a change and not what the advocates write, often nonsense. So <laughs> I read what I like and I play golf when I want to. And my wife and I hope Corona goes away so that we can travel the world. Well, and that was the, the final point I was going to make is that as you heard Professor Kietz uh, say, we, we're busy uh, building a, a new addition to the to the faculty and uh, part of that includes designated space to have uh, justices and judges in, in residence. So precisely so that they can impart this type of wisdom to, to the next generation. Uh, we, we always say we want to produce the next generation of, and we happen to start with Mosinekes and, and the like, and uh, that, you know, that would mean so much to us to, to welcome you to the, to the faculty when it is safe to. Yes, to do. I'm waiting for the invitation. And remember, I am an alumnus of the university. So it will be a privilege as always, and you know all my connections, which Professor Kiet so ably described. So I have an umbilical cord with that university and responsibility to somebody who is not here, but who has served us very dearly. It's been a great privilege, uh, Justice Mosaneke, to have this uh, time with you. I want to uh, really thank you on behalf of the faculty and the university. I'd also like to thank Professor Kiert and the management committee of the university, the vice chancellor and her team who've taken time off from their meeting today to, to listen to us. And then to Thomas Hilmer, Alison Olifir, Debbie Derry and Zandile and Babela from communication and marketing and of course everyone in attendance. Thank you very, very much. It's been a great pleasure. Of course, the privilege was mine.